hello, hello, Kyra K family. <laughs> um, so I just want to say hello. Tony here is our guest host today, um, who's technically taking like my spot, but and I was because I was not supposed to be on tonight. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't you know, celebrate or whatever. Today is Easter right now in the U S and I had planned to be gone for this show, but unfortunately van is stuck in traffic right now and will hopefully be back soon. But I want to make sure I say hi to Mr. Berger from Jedi council of America. Hello, Saber Academy online. Um, yeah, I know, I know that one. And then how say Wong. Hello, say Wong Duran Duran. Hi, Raf. Good to see all of you night vision. I I'm really happy to see you. Um, good to see all of you. I think I just caught, I think I caught all of you. Um, Tony's here. Say hello. Hi, everybody. So if you see me <laughs> typing in the comments, it's not going to come down as Commander. It's going to come down as Kyber Cave Productions because yep. I am signed in. I'm, I'm actually maze of instead of myself. Yes, I'm not saluting at the moment, saying Wong. Actually, when Van does get out of traffic and is able to sign in and come on, he'll take over and I'll head out to go finish hanging out with my family for the rest of the day. Um, Commander is Tony, yes. And he has also been a guest host on our show and a guest himself, um, which is, it's always great to see you, Tony. I hope you've had a good week and you had a good Easter. Uh, you always have my respect. You have to work with a van and there's always these emergencies <laughs> and the audience and you've sung for us a couple of times. I, mean, I have, it's amazing. been a while since I've sung, especially I have not sung with my brand new mic too. The, I've had, I got this in November and it's a good, it's a really good mic. You've probably seen, I mean, a lot of you who watch like podcasts or see you know, clips of it. This is a mic that's pretty right. well known for being on there. And I have right. not had a chance to actually sing with it yet. I'm not going to do that right now, y'all. Okay, you'll survive without me singing a little bit. Um, uh, you got to gear up in the future, though. Yeah, you got you got you got to hype me a little bit. I can't just sing it. I am auditioning for some. Uh, well, I did audition, and I got two solos in my choir concert coming up uh, that I got to start really nailing down and rehearse for. So, um, anyway, all right, guys. So tonight. The first thing that we usually do, what is it that we usually do? We do our nerdy news. So, here is our nerdy news for the day. The first on the nerdy news is Star Wars Movies and Series Viewing Guide. If you've never watched Star Wars, but you enjoy our show and you want to catch up, especially before Acolyte comes out, this viewing guide, which is linked in the description below, actually gives you both a chronological or a released date order of all the movies and tv shows and you can check it out and see which you know which one would you like to start with first if you want to catch up with all the Star wars and be geeks like the rest of us <laughs> um the next thing is ilm industrial light and magic that is the vfx company that's done star wars they've done so many different movies they did et so you can't even imagine how many they've done you can look them up if you really feel like you need to but they actually took the uh, they they projected Star Wars onto the Empire State Building, which I think was really cool. And if you're really interested about how they did it and what went into it, linked in the description below is an article that will take you to all about and where I got this picture from. You can see all the information about how they got it on there, you know, what came about, how it came about and stuff. Hi, Legit Jedi. Impressive, most impressive. <laughs> Good to see you in the chat, Legit Jedi. I saw your comments recently, too. So thank you for coming. Hey, back. Matt. Oh, you were saying hi to. Oh, is that? Oh, yeah. Legit Jedi. He's Matt. Yes. Oh. My, my brain blinked, and I thought that we also have Matt Granda that appears in our chat sometimes. And so <laughs> I thought maybe I'd missed him. But that is your nerdy news for today. Um, so thank you very much for bringing, you know, we got that on. We, we were preparing for me to be gone, but look, I just ended up doing it anyway. <laughs> um, that's just what happens. Um, Van it was at a con today, this whole weekend, pretty much. And so that is actually why he's late. Uh, traffic had an accident and he should be on the next 10 to 15 minutes but as you know next we have james kaiser who is our producer for flow of the show uh, every week he brings us the flow and this week is a really i really enjoyed watching this one perform if you'd like to check out angelo flores who is our flow for tonight there's a link in the description below to his facebook page so you can check that out but for now please enjoy his flow
All right, that know. was your flow. Kaiser finds the greatest uh, flow people. I mean, they're he really always, does. And I'm glad yeah. to get to showcase them on the show because they're amazing. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite parts of the show. Actually, the whole show I love, but it's also a part I really look forward to. And legit, did I? I do agree with you. That was some really good floor work. My knees were hurting watching him do this, like the like, mm -hmm. like the the you know like the knee. I don't even know how to call it, but what to call it. But it looked really cool, and um, it kind of looked like he almost had his own saber made of fire, and then the handle was very very long, like the handle of that instrument he was using. Was quite long. Uh, Je legit Jedi said, "Neck roll with a flaming sword." That's legit AF. Awesome flow. Legit awesome flow. Not the AF I was thinking of. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. So very much enjoyed that flow. That was a lot of fun. James Kaiser, thank you again, our producer for Flow of the Show. Always brings us some great flows every week. He himself is a flow artist. So if you would like to actually check out James Kaiser on YouTube, his YouTube is Darth Cephalus. If you need to check that out, if you watch the intro to the beginning of the show, he I actually put his Darth Cephalus name if you need to like learn how to spell it or something like that. Um, guys, don't forget, we also have an, another show coming up soon. It's called The New Order with uh, host Aubrey. She is like our dungeon master and we're doing like an RPG adventure. And right now we have seven episodes recorded that we are editing and it will be coming out every week when it starts. If you'd like to see the teaser trailer that is actually on our channel right now and you can check that out. All right, it's time for our guest, y'all. Um, he's a wonderful guy. I've been ha I hang out in his Discord, the Discord that we have a Discord together that we're in, and and I saw him post about the link here for tonight. So I'm very excited to listen. And Tony will be doing the interview. So please welcome. I'm gonna say it wrong. I know it. Mick von Rieben. Was that right, Mick? I can see you. I can, okay. <laughs> he's nodding, so I got it right. I'm from Kyush and Ludo Swartz. Okay, I guess we're going to get started. Hey, Mike. So folks don't know, but we were online uh, for quite a bit uh, talking and getting to know each other. Uh, as most of you know, I was in the Navy. And as I told Mike, in my 20 years in the Navy, I never met an Australian I didn't like. They put out uh, great beer, great films, great actors. And now it looks like they're taking a uh, lightsaber world by storm. Um, I got a chance to research what Mike's doing over in Australia. And it's fantastic. Now, I got chosen to do this uh, this little uh, co-hosting like <laughs> a day or so ago, so bear with me. Um, so what I wanted to do, Mike, is I wanted you to introduce yourself. You know, um, I'm always fascinated by Australia. Um, it is the, one of the few countries I haven't been to. Um, I've, I've been stationed on aircraft carriers. Of course, mine didn't go, went to Korea and never got a chance to stop in like every other aircraft carrier that was out there during my time. Uh, so kind of explain where you're located and they kind of grow up, you're in your martial arts journey, and then finally your journey into uh, saber sports, lightsaber sports. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, it's absolutely amazing to be here, especially from Australia. Uh, as, you, as you know, um, internationally, lightsaber combat sport is just completely taken off, but um, we've been a bit sluggish here to get it going. So in terms of my background, uh, I'm a martial arts instructor. Uh, I run a dojo here in Adelaide, so I'm in South Australia, which is not as far low as you can go in Australia, um, but it's pretty low. Uh, and I started my martial arts journey back in 2010. Um, so there's a bit of an understanding. I'm about 30, I'm 38 now. I just turned 38. And so it's been about, yeah, about, well, I guess it's 14 years now. I've uh, been yeah, an instructor yeah. for the last couple of years. And um, so my background particularly is is Aikido and, and Kenjits. Um, I, I learned some Jiu-Jitsu as well uh, the last couple of years under a, a new a new instructor, a new sensei, um, Sensei Carl, who you may be listening, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, it's been quite an impressive journey. Um, and I guess uh, what where I'm at now is trying to find ways in which I can engage people in a completely different format. And when I first heard about Saber Combat and and um, what was happening around the world? I, I, to, to me, it was quite obvious that this is 
very much a new paradigm. This is a new way in which we can approach uh, traditional martial arts and, and uh, whatever background you are, whether it's Tima or, or fencing or, or Aikido in all the Japanese forms. Uh, and uh, so I, I was very excited by what I saw. And um, for me, I've spent the last 12 months trying to understand, you know, what does this thing look like in the context of a, a Japanese martial art? And so I guess, yeah, that's, that's very much where I've, I've come from, from that perspective. Um, so, but uh, yeah, I mean, about yourself, um, so, so, Tony, I, I, I've been following your stuff on Facebook for some time. And uh, really, it's, it's your crew, I think, that's helped us, especially in Australia, to, to see um, what other groups around the world have been doing. Well, I mean, uh, first off, in Aikido, are there weapons? Is there weapons training like there is in karate and uh, the Korean arts? There is, yeah. So Aikido does have uh, Joe and, and Boken. Uh, and part of that is the, the founder, um, Ushiba, uh, Maria Ushiba. When he started, he was coming out of um, a form called Daitaru Aikijujutsu. And it was very much um, a belief that um, weapons had a very important role in Aikido. And so there are a lot of techniques that lend themselves very well to um, when you when you look at um, from Kenjut's perspective or um, Jujut's. Um, there's a lot of kind of uh, things that have been um, that are embedded in Aikido, uh, such as movement and form, that lend themselves very well to that. And so that's why a lot of the weapons training has been a complement to Aikido as well. If you ever do Aikido, um, you generally a, a good dojo will also have weapons training too. Well, you find in Aikido, Aikido is one of those martial arts that is circular motions. So you're moving in a circle and, and taking the momentum of your opponent. It looks to me like that would be really helpful in teaching your students uh, choreography. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so because we do a lot of, uh, in fact, uh, my old instructor used to say that Aikido is 50% ukemi which is break falling, you know, you spend 50% of your time break falling, you're getting up, you're getting down, um, you're rolling all over the place. Uh, and then when you just put a lightsaber in your hand um, and you you are working on your flourishes and your flow work, uh, and then you're, you're combining that with your body as well. So you're moving all over the place, you're, you're, you're diving, you're break falling. It just, it looks phenomenal. It's quite amazing. Yeah. So you, let me, so I know a little bit about your online. Are you a number of schools? Because I got the uh, I got the impression that you're in different locations. So if you look at the Silver Sabers in England, they've they've got Silver Saber. I'm going to call them franchises. They're not that, but let's say martial arts studios in different locations throughout England. Is that something that like what you're doing down there? You know, I sorry. wish I was that far ahead. Uh, unfortunately, we're we're not that far advanced yet. Um, but what we have are a number of different programs, and those programs I've, I've somewhat kept, or at least you know. Um, right. So is uh, it out of one dojo? Uh, just to make it really clear, so you're operating yeah, so we have, out we have, of one dojo. We have three dojos um, in in Adelaide, but we also um, work with other clients all over the place too. So mostly we're we're, we're focused in Adelaide. That's our area. But um, the idea sure. for Australia is to really get other groups um, that haven't maybe had the chance to really expand their programs to come on board with us, and then we can start to really um, spread across Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could be like uh, like um, Saber Legion. If you look at the Saber Legion model, that that is spread throughout the United States, and now they've got uh, play, uh, charters around the world as well. And then um, in our country, light speed is moving on, and across in Europe, they're they're doing something sort of similar. But Saber Legion is a good model for spreading and not having to have a ton of money. Um, so, would you be willing to have like a league throughout Australia? Australia is a good sized continent. Absolutely, yeah. So we we held our first, um, I guess, more state based tournament in in September last year, which was Saber Skirmish. Um, we're really hoping to poach some. We have some excellent um, crew over in Perth, uh, which is the Moss Eisley Moss Eisley School. Uh, we're hoping right. we can get them over here as well. And and uh, I know there's some in Melbourne, but for the most part, it's actually been very very small. And I think what it is is um, there are there are perhaps groups that aren't so. I'm confident with doing the sports side of things, um, which is understandable. Um, but hopefully, if they they we can all work together and maybe make something even bigger. Oh, I, that would be so. And you're so you're operating out of three three dojos, and are the dojos split between teaching uh, traditional martial arts and then have a lightsaber component to them? Is that how it works? And then you have an instructor at each dojo who can either teach both, or you have one that's a specific to each each discipline. 
Yeah, so uh, really what it is is um, we have one one central dojo that still continues on our Aikido and, and, and weapons. Um, we have others that are focused purely on Sabre um, because that's just simply the demand for those. Uh, and it's really, I've just staggered it across the week. So I have, I have some fantastic senior students um, that can help manage those things. Uh, but at the moment, we're, we're so small, we're still only with uh, one main instructor. <laughs> uh, are you the main instructor? I am the main instructor. Yes, <laughs> just like I am. You're a one. You're a one man show. So, yeah. I, you know, I'm going to go a little into the weeds because obviously I'm an instructor as well. When you what style? So, kenjutsu is not the same as aikido. It's not the same as karate. Uh, Saber Legion is not the same as light speed, which is not the same of, as sports Saber League in France or ASL FFE or silver sabers in the Linton Cup. So there's just a bunch of different styles of lightsaber mm. combat. Um, my school has its own unique style that we really, we kind of borrowed the ideas from two European styles and sort of merged them. But what kind do you teach there at yours? I mean, how do you yeah. fight? You have heavy blades, uh, heavy thick graded blades. You have the little whippy ones like they do in light speed. We use medium grade blades. What are you, what are you using? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're using two mil um, blades. Uh, we do um, have requirements. So I, know I should explain. We've really got three main divisions, and those three divisions are important to understand how we right. um, focus the rules of the games. So I think I was saying before backstage that we have the first division, which is a choreographed side of things, and that's really designed for people um, who want to create something like an exhibition piece. They want to add cosplay elements into it and really try all sorts of different uh, weapons and, and styles. So right. whatever, is that whatever a specific, point So is that a specific class, it, its own entity? People come in and go, Absolutely. this is what I want to do, flow and choreography. I don't want to do the sport part of it. Exactly. And we do get clients like that. We get we get people who are like, look, I'm not really into confrontation. I'd prefer to work on something that's a bit more story driven and I can still yeah. get you know fit, but uh, something I guess is going to push my skills a little bit further. Oh, and sure. that's where you'll see a lot more break falling, a lot more dynamic movement, a lot more of the more complex um, techniques that are in our old traditions, but don't necessarily lend themselves well to a uh, more of a grappling based sport. So, um, so I like to keep them there as part of our historical roots. Um, but they're, they're more about exemplifying a technique uh, and bringing that out rather than the combative sport-based side. Right. Um, so to amplify, that that group is your choreography group. If you've got a community-based event, that's the group that's going to go out and do it, correct? They're the ones that are going to wear costumes and all that. Do you have a standard choreography or is it up to the students to build their own? Yeah, so um, I'm actually working on form, um, finalizing what I'm calling mythologies. Mythologies are um, almost half choreograph, half graphic novels. So the idea is to um, wow. have students um, engrossed in a story, and then they are filling in, um, the, the, I guess they're performing the, the, those fight scenes themselves. And from that, we can really start to look at things like, you know, um, some small time uh, movie making with some green screens and maybe some post-production work for home ed students or other students that you might get from a term-based uh, kind of yeah, that term basis. So there, there's plenty of opportunities there for a whole different way of looking at martial arts, um, especially from that stunt based level. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, because this is going into what I what I read and saw on the material that you sent to uh, uh, Saber Rattle. So is that the gamification part, or is that no, no? So um, so I'll move on then to the so the, oh, no, the no, other two okay. divisions. Okay. It's yeah. okay because I'm interested in your choreography. I mean, choreography <laughs> is, a, is a big deal. And if you guys are doing it and you're building storylines that your students are going in, that's not something that's being done in a lot of other places. Um, mm. there's, a, there's a school in Russia that sort of does that. And since mm. the war started, we haven't heard from them. But, you know, that is a really unique perspective to have a separate choreography class. Mm. I have a choreography team, but we're not doing what you do, they'll build a routine on their own, but they won't put it in terms of a, of a saga or a story. So, you know, my hat's off to, to you guys to do it that way. So moving on to your next level, and I'm, I'm going to, because I'm a, I'm a uh, old man, I can only handle one concept at a time. So, <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, I, I've got to make, I've got to dumb this down. There's so much I want to ask you because you've got so many cool things going on in there, but I'm going to take it one step at a time. Okay, so that was your first group. It's its own class. It's a choreography class. 
it, it, you're, you're building a storyline, which the students work into. And that group has already gone out and done public events, I'm guessing. Correct. Uh, do you get in there? Do you get in the costume? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, in the, I think there was a nice good shot there of, a, of our group. Um, and you'll see the the one with the white and black. Um, that, that's that's me. Uh, but, awesome. Uh, we've all, hey, you're a good looking all tried guy. to draw. <laughs> well, that's why I try to cover the face so that uh, I don't scare the children. <laughs> that's all right. It just, it just looks like an Australian face, like you got into a fight at, at the barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So your second group, what is that? So same, same so, dojo. Yeah, so other th um, for those who really are wanting that sport element, uh, we have uh, the light armored division, and the light armored division is um, exactly like you'll be used to um, in terms of um, set matches. If you're looking at, we, we are armored. We don't tend to do unarmored like Ludo Sport, though I certainly tip my hat to that that level of skill. Um, but the Saber Legion and um, uh, your other typical armored based sport yeah, um they all wear they all wear armor uh, ludo sport exactly. is its own unique thing uh and it is God yeah, yeah. Uh, so what kind of armor are they wearing yeah. and, and this is an important question because what saber legion wears and what Lightspeed in the u.s wear are two totally different things and they're two different styles of fighting so what yeah. kind of armor is your light group wearing we went through a few different iterations um, trying to find, I guess, as you know, you're trying to balance um, uh, cost so that students who are coming yeah. to, to do this are not having, uh, it's cost prohibitive for them. It's got to be secure and safe. Um, it can't be something that's restricting the movement too much. So um, very standard, of course, I think across all groups is um, the N60 fencing mask, just pretty basic, right. Um, right. You know, your standard entry mask. Um, then we have um, for gloves, we're using motorcycle impact gloves with some thumb protection. Though, as you right. can tell, it doesn't cover everything. Um, sometimes no, tips no. get injured. We had a um, uh, one of our members, she unfortunately um, fractured um, her pinky. So it's a matter of constantly reviewing that, you know, is this really protecting yeah. people? We moved on to um, lacrosse gloves for motorcycle gloves. Yep. What was that, sorry? You're... Yeah, we use lacrosse gloves. That's and lacrosse, we have yeah. the same issue where the fingertips are, are vulnerable. But you can buy protective caps for that. That's correct, yeah. Um, in terms of the armor, we've got a couple of different ones that we've used. The very first ones that we're getting into are just nice, good standard motorcycle armor. What we do find is that thrusting here is not very um, good. It's you know, it's just a zipper. It's not going to protect you too much in the sternum. Right, right. Though I have to say that we've been running this for about 12 months across all sorts of groups. Um, again, some students who usually hit way too hard than they should, and it's done surprisingly well. Um, so we've, we've been quite happy with that. But we've also been trialing um, uh, police riot armor. So we've got hold of various different styles of police riot armor. And you'll see some of that in the, the Grand Saga posters that we've, we've made and put out there. Um, and they look really cool. There's one that we call the Pallet and armor that's just really chunky cyberpunk looking um plated armor and it's just it's just police right armor and i mean if it's designed to take that then for the most part it, it does all right of course but as you know there are some areas still that if you are very proficient at what you do then you can target and take advantage of so we have to be very careful again of the strike areas um right, right, so what right, that's right. done is lead us to say look the only areas you can strike is top side of head um we, while we accept that neck might sometimes happen with slipping up uh, we've got neck protectors um but uh we've made that particularly prohibited to have a direct thrust to the neck and then it's just the chest um right. so arms don't count um back doesn't count hands don't count they won't necessarily give you a, a penalty but um they won't award you any points right, certainly a right, shot right. to the groin will will uh, get you a penalty <laughs> well supposed to be wearing cuffs yeah we've used motorcycle armor it's pretty effective but we don't thrust so and we yeah. use medium grade blades uh there is a company in ukraine uh we've been you we have most of my students have bought uh lightsaber armor for them it's customized for each individual and has done pretty well so i'm going to give a shout out to soft warrior um the police armor i looked at in the past the only problem was it was more expensive than say buying hema gear so maybe in australia it's a little bit cheaper um but but what you're doing is exactly what everybody else is doing trying to keep keep the cost down for your students and then what kind of blade so we're still in the, in your light are you using two millimeter blades are you using a little bit heavier blades i mean why the concern with the thrust 
Mm. Yeah. So we um we trialed um, initially when we got our lightsabers that were standard two mil blades, and we tried that for a good while, and and we thought well maybe we should try the three mil and see how that goes. And what we found was that the three mil blades had a greater prone to breaking. They also ironically, um, which is the one thing we were trying to avoid, um, they 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 don't flex as well, which is actually right. not the best. So if you have obviously a saber right. hitting you hard from a thrust and it's not flexing then you're going to get more of that force. And we thought, well, actually, the two mil is probably a lot safer in that respect. So um, we've gone back to two mil. We, we think that's pretty worthwhile keeping standard. Now, that's yeah. one inch diameter. Um, we do have a member who uses the, the three quarter inch. I think it was like Lightspeed Saber League. They use that as right, well. Right. Um, real whippy, but uh, we real haven't, it hasn't been standard across ours because only because the hilts yeah. that we use typically are one inch diameter. Yeah, I mean that's pretty standard around the world. The one inch, the one inch hilt for your thrust on the motorcycle armor. You can get just a cheap plastic plastron and stick it underneath, and you know that'll avoid any injury through the zipper. But I'll, so far, it sounds exactly like what more like what Saber Legion style fighting than light speed. So you're kind of more um, light, but sort of HEMA style. So you can thrust, you can hit what you can hit with the flat of the blade, or in this case, there is no flat with lightsabers. And do you have um, do you have rules on the amount of force? That's been a big issue in the United States um, with all lightsaber is control the amount of force. And everybody's gone out of their way for safety on this. Yeah. Yeah, there is a clear, I think a clear line when it becomes aggressive and it's quite, it's quite hard. And we try to explain to people, look, you're not getting any extra points for hitting hard. Uh, it's it's about accuracy. It's about defense. Getting out of there, getting your point in, and and you know protecting yourself and your and your your partner. Um, and we find actually that um, when people learn um, that there is a level of intensity that is acceptable and not acceptable, then as you know, when you're working with community groups uh, with students who who might have um, some behavioral um, concerns or issues, then actually it's a really good learning um, device for them to say you know this is not acceptable and really you've got to tone down that aggression and i found students who um, when they first started some of our programs were quite aggressive but they then became champions for checking for that level of intensity and i think that's a fantastic turnaround you know there is a time and place for physically belting hard but that's what we call it light armored you know it's it's intended to be light armored yeah i mean obviously you're a great instructor you're allowing a little free play but teaching safety and control at the same time. So, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly have confidence sending a, a child to your school. So <laughs> does that, so the fencing in, uh, I guess they call it the flurry um, level, which is that light armor level. Do they, do, is there, um, do you have teams? Do you go and fence others, you know, other schools? Are they broken down into groups like factions? Um, I'm considering, I have three young instructors, each of them are in their twenties and I'm considering breaking my school into three and giving each one and creating a faction. And I learned that from, from you now, I, I think, <laughs> wow, what a great idea. So do you have, what do you, how do you, how do they compete? Yeah. Um, so what you're touching on there is, is a, a new get kind of game format that we've been, um, about to launch fully officially in July, um, uh, but it's called Grand Saga. And so Grand Saga, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed when I saw all these saber combat groups doing amazing work around the world is, as you mentioned, we we're all kind of starting to look at our own interpretations and things and unfortunately becoming a bit siloed. Um, and if you have different rule sets and you train in different ways, it can be a bit prohibitive in terms of meeting together and, and you know, joining in the same tournament. For example, I, my guys probably could never join a Ludo sport tournament because they're not trained that way. They'd be more at home at a, at a Saber Legion tournament. Um, but saying that, you know, what, what all these different groups are doing is fantastic. So what I wanted to do was create um, this, this kind of uh, a strategic, it's a blend of Saber Combat and Risk, the board game Risk, where you are, you're joining teams, there is um, a, a faction leader, uh, and there's a cleric, a second in command. And the teams will vary between um, six, a minimum of six to 11, 11 people. And, that, and for us, that's only because when we run our games, we need a minimum of six people. We need a judge, a ref, um, we need tables. So some doing the timing and someone doing the scorekeeping and right. that's two, two fighters. So that's for us, that's a really good format. And we find that games run really, really smoothly and well, and everybody has a part to play. Um, and so with Grand Saga, the idea is that um, you'll be on a fictional planet 
and that planet will have outposts. Uh, and so you will have your faction leader um, will know that they are uh, scheduled to fight another another team ahead of time, but they will decide which of their fighters will conduct an assault in that particular phase and which fighters will then defend in a subsequent match later. Uh, and in order to win that outpost, you have to put, you have to basically have three fighters forward and the opposing team has three fighters forward and you've got to win two out of the three of those matches. Uh, and so it could be, it could be any real um, set of rule set, whatever rule set you're using, um, it, whatever game style that you're using, as long as you can officiate the match and you can have a very clear winner and loser, then that basically allows anybody to, to jump in in this large open universe with its own original characters, stories, and battles. And um, so at the moment, I think I showed you an older galactic map, but we've now produced a galactic map that has 55 locations. So each of those locations could be in its own season, literally a year-long um, season that runs somewhere between 20 weeks, depending on how many teams you've got in that season. Um, a, a season or a saga could have five five teams in it or up to seven teams or as low as three teams. Um, so you can kind of see the scale that is. And then if, if for example, if my, my crew is working on one planet and they have houses that they've pledged allegiance to, so there's there's five, um, five cannon houses. You have the Emperor, the, the, which is called the Emperor's Hand. You have um, the Aori, which is like this dark kind of dark elven religious type. It's, it's, I don't want to say it's dark Jedi because that's Sith. <laughs> like, right, right, right. But it's, it's, I guess it's more akin to a Warhammer, you know, um, Frank Herbert Dune type universe. Um, so you, you can think of it more like Harkonnens and Atreides and stuff like that. Um, and then you've got uh, the Revolution, uh, which are more like Junkers, uh, and they're 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 only the outer colonies. You have um, uh, which you have uh, regional houses as well. So a regional house would be a house that's not that doesn't have its own kind of armada and fleet that's all over the place in this galactic map but it, it might be loc located to particular planets and so in this in in the um the first saga that we're doing this year um we have one called the mori clan and they are kind of more samurai futuristic uh esque style of uh faction uh, so house i should say because i should make that distinction between a faction and a house a faction is your team your your physical team which you might do all sorts of sagas and pledge allegiance to all sorts of houses but the house is like the the fictional the fictional group that you've got to pledge allegiance to for that saga but the benefit of doing it that way means that you know i can have a crew here in, in australia um, that pledges allegiance to an emperor uh, to the, the emperor's hand and that expands um that, that they might do really well in a season and control a planet and likewise your crew um, in the US might pledge allegiance. So some of them might pledge allegiance to similar, the same houses. And they are contributing to this large collective effort towards controlling this, this whole universe. So it's quite, so it's quite if ambitious. I, if, if I could just maybe it's, get a little, on some specific ad. Hey, <laughs> hey Van, you, you're coming in at the right time. Oh, <laughs> uh, Van, Van can't hear us. You're going to have to fix it over there because I don't know how to fix it. So I don't know if he's going to send me a text or something because I have become. Go ahead, go ahead, Van. Oh, you want me to keep going? Shake your head up and down. Okay. All right. So let's say Aiken Saber Academy is a faction, and I have a team of uh, up to eleven. All right. I've seen your 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 production. You have all these planets, and for folks, it's it's really very cool, and it's all on YouTube, and you have a planet. So if I if we pledged to say an emperor in the Grand Saga and we and we had a faction name, well, let's just say Aiken, um, if we, we and maybe I can split the two factions because we're not, obviously not in Australia, um, there's an actual fight that happens, correct? So if I bring if I bring a team to fight another team um, and we win, we will win a geographic point in your fictional universe, correct? So it would for uh, for yourself. It would look like something like uh, you would be what we would refer to as a game master, someone who says, "Look, I want to establish a season, um, our own saga. We're gonna we want to battle on um, this particular planet." And uh, so you might 
you might um, you might even potentially propose your own planet with your own um, backstory. So you might go as far as like a dungeon master coming up with the ar arcing quests of that planet and uh, the reason why those houses are on that planet and why they're fighting and, and things. And then uh, so you might say, right, and, and to do this, I'm going to recruit. Uh, I'm going to recruit some people in, in July. So, for example, we're recruiting this year at Avcon uh, in Adelaide, and we need at least a minimum of um, – we want we want to aim for 40, but we need a minimum of 30 people. And 30 people um, kind of gives us um, at least six people per team uh, for, for a five-house type um, saga. And uh, so it's a really great way for you to say um, to, to build up hype for your for your school and say, look, we're we're launching Grand Saga this year. And you might get people that just want to be a part of the saga. They don't, might not necessarily want to do anything else. But at the very least, they're with you along that way. And then th that's right. that saga is going to last for 20 weeks. So um, so it would be very difficult if you had just one faction because um, you wouldn't have anybody to fight with. Uh, right, right. But, yeah. But if I, have so, 20, say, if I have 20 students, I could have two factions. Yeah, well, potentially with 20 students, um, I guess, you know, factor of uh, six, uh, we maybe bump it up to 21 and then you could have, you yeah. know, three of three of seven. Right. So um, right. then you have right. three, three factions battling each other. Uh, and so then um, we would we would have a planet for you where it would be a three house planet and uh, with its its unique story, whether you want to put forward your story if you you want us to come up with that story so we need some time to to come up with uh, part of that um you can think of it very much like dungeons and dragons uh so once they've gone through so we, we give you um the templates for scheduling those matches uh at the end of that saga each of the participants will receive a trophy with the winning house uh receiving a like a, a, a gold trophy um and then it's um it's pushing forward the saga so once the year's finished um we'll have um a, a larger story that is has recapped so whether it's um like a you might read that through just a simple an article or um we've we talked about it through um uh, hopefully a podcast we intend to get off the ground for grand right. saga so um, so once you get the grand saga up and once you have everything in place in theory in theory you can have organizations from around the world uh contact whoever whatever organization you have set up and say we're in france and we have you know 36 people we sure like to do this yeah. and they so long as they sent you all the information that they need would there be a cost for that group yeah, so um, it would be a matter of um, a. Are they also activating um, their their unique gamer account with us on our portal, which um, is about I think from last recall, if you're not a member with our club but you're you're opening an account on the portal, that's ten dollars a month Australian, which I think is like six or seven dollars a month. Um, and then of course, um, if we're providing the trophies, then there's a cost for that as well. Right. But overall, um, the the idea is to be very. Um, low cost so that any group that might not necessarily even have an affiliation of a large organization can really drive these forward and contribute to a much larger universe. I, I think that is an absolutely brilliant idea. Um, from what I can see, you were on Indiegogo and you were trying to raise the money for, I guess, creating the, the universe. So building in, um, I'm not going to say movie animations and, and stuff like that. Is that correct? So, so yeah, the Indiegogo that we've launched is, is, is a slightly different um, program, but I can see why um, you'd mentioned it because um, one of the benefits of having such a large um, universe that it says its own original um, characters and stories is um, is feeding it back into other programs. So I mentioned before about with the choreographed um, classes, the the unarmored division. Right. We also have mythologies, and the idea of a mythology is to have a, a graphic novel with then right. set set fight scenes that are choreographed that students can learn those fight sequences uh, yeah. and then right. record their own okay. videos over time. So that also draws from those same characters and universe and planets, and if they might be wholly original characters that students have also put forward, in which case. We we would call non-canon characters necessarily that might not necessarily fall into the larger grand sagas but they the idea is they're part of a larger universe uh you've got to be a busy man because i can't even uh wrap my head around the mythologies although i can understand that better than the grand saga i couldn't imagine me trying to create it i'm i'm, I'm a little old for that um <laughs> van's going to come on and i hope van is listening so van you got to tell me when we need to wrap it up because i could i could go forever so can when we need to now? wrap it up, yeah. Ah, yeah, I can, can hear you. You can hear me? Okay. Oh my gosh, yeah. I can hear. I, I'm, yay! Oh my god, this has been. 
this has been absolutely incredible watching from the and I apologize for being late. I was at a convention today. Traffic was absolutely horrible. Horrible. Do not move to the Bay Area. At any rate, um, this is like I feel like I, I'm not sure if I'm listening to saber fighting or a Netflix a Netflix saga that I want to watch. This seems like something I could tune into every week and uh, and see different factions battling each other. <laughs> well, this is this, I mean, what's really interesting? They're both. He's saber fighting, and he's got the school, everything we've got, and then he's got everything all is rest and it's just uh, it's fascinating what what it's like um, real world Mike, Mike is doing it right and it sounds like that's something you could run out of your you know your own store that in kyber cave put together a, a oh, faction man, this is, of a this bunch of people absolutely fantastic i am so excited i apologize i couldn't be here for the beginning of this i can't wait to go back home and watch the beginning of this whole thing um first off i want to thank tony and i want to thank marissa for holding it down uh while while i was out but um Tony, you're doing great. We got about ten more minutes, uh, and then uh, okay. you know, uh, then we can wrap it up. And um, but I, you know, we could go all night. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I, I have no, no doubt. So let me let me continue on to you got ten minutes. And Mike, I wanted to get to your 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 third group because uh, I find that interesting. A lot of my friends are in Boo Hurt, and they they're armored combat guys, um, the Palmetto Knights. So you have a heavy armor lightsaber group as well yeah so one of the things that's actually the probably the the, the one that has had the least work on it um uh, but the the uh, the point of the heavy armor division um really comes back to where i'm at personally in understanding technical um aspects of my martial art so um i'm very inspired by bohurt i think we've got a few great fantastic groups in south australia um so uh it's and, and i'm pretty sure that they have um been overseas as well and i remember seeing something about palmetto knights um but a uh, fantastic um crew and i'm inspired by what they do uh, of course it's too cost prohibitive for me <laughs> uh, well, and i'm yeah. sure oh, that yeah. there are expensive. many people that also feel that way but you know you look at the way they train uh you look at the techniques they use um drawn very much uh, a lot of judo applications in there um one of the things i've wanted to do was say well look what would a cyberpunk uh, heavy armored kind of bohurt um, with lightsabers look like. And one of the things I think would be important to differentiate is what I want to achieve with it, which is that um, I want to focus on disarms. So where bohurt looks at taking an opponent to the ground and making sure that they're not, they're not falling over either. Um, uh, it's, it's only one aspect of what I would like to achieve in a heavy armor division. So we're training at the moment to do takedowns, but also to do disarms. And of course that in itself has a lot of inherent risk. It's very easy to snap a person's wrist um, in a way that you don't want right. to. So we have to develop ways where we are a trying to disarm some of the lightsaber. So that means reducing your contact to only this part of the hilt, but also then not doing it in a way where you're grabbing their wrist and you're applying pressure to that wrist, only really grabbing the little bit of hilt in between their two hands if they're holding it a certain right, way or if they're right. only holding it one-handed. Um, and of course, so what we're finding... So if I can ask a clarification, if I could. All right. So when I hear heavy armor, a lot of, you know, I think Saber Legion and a lot of leather, a lot of really thick types of, of protective gear, totally different than, say, what my guys are doing, even with the, even with the stuff from Ukraine. What are your what are your your requirements for the heavy armor? You're going to be doing takedown, and you're gonna. I'm guessing you're going to be hitting hard too. Absolutely. So um, it's very much drawing on that uh, that uh, police riot armor, but also having those underlayers too, so that we can protect the areas where the armor doesn't protect. The other thing that's a real consideration for us is the back of the head. Um, so we're in light armored. You might not necessarily if you're not targeting or it's very incidental to strike the back of the head, right. um, especially in like armor contact, if you're doing heavy armor, we've got heavy strikes and you could potentially be using the, the metal part of that, that saber um, or hitting someone by accident and cracking with the back of the head. If you're doing a, a three verse three, um, then you need to really take that on board. And which is why it's really been the slowest project for us because we have to make sure hundred percent that um, people are safe um, in what they do. And so that means we're also trying to work with a lot of the, the Bohurt guys here in South Australia to understand, you know, what are the things that they've encountered when they've done this and how does um, something that doesn't use metal armor, but still might have its own um, restrictions change that, that dynamic. So um, yeah, I guess that's, there's a lot to take in. Right. Um, right. So it's yeah. not a, a, a HEMA hood. 
or one of the back of the head protectors? Is that not enough? Look, it, it quite possibly could be. The problem is um, trial and error. So while we can, and we do have people that put that on and, and making sure that that is protected, right. there might be other ways in which, um, again, it, 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 it's just something that we have overlooked that um, can still present a risk. So as you know, when it comes to really developing anything that it carries this level of um, risk. It's just taking it really slowly, um, looking at what does work and then trialing that in our own space. Um, I would suggest, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention Soft Warrior in Ukraine. They're also, uh, they're also car armored combat guys. So even though they develop foam weapons, they're also developing different kind of plastics to train in boot hurt and armored combat. But with plastics, contact them. See what they can come up with you that's reasonably cost effective and will just attach itself to a current uh, fencing mask because they've done some amazing work with plastics and now nobody else in, yeah. that I know of is doing exactly the same work for so many different different styles. They did me a favor by doing the lightsaber armor, but uh, it sounds like for you, they could build an all plastic kind of thing that's not metal, but it's yeah. armor for every part. And in fact, they already have built armor it's all plastic. It's just lighter weight than metal. And um, I don't think it's going to be a, a, certainly not as expensive as the, as the metal armor, but it'd be, be very protective and they can customize to whatever you need and their prices are reasonable. But having yeah. said that, have you got this off the ground yet? Is it part of your school? Um, this particular off? part is while we've got people training in these techniques, um, it's not something that we expect to get off the ground till at least after Grand Saga is well established. Um, but a again, um, where I do envision um, this, and I, and I should mention, you know, um, it's probably a much larger conversation here regarding gamification and um, sportification. But uh, where I do see something like this is, you know, I'm tr trying to draw a lot of how I say, uh, a lot of uh, reference from, have you seen Karate Combat with like uh, Bas Rutten and, and things? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, not my, yeah, not look, my art. I was a boxer more than I was in Asian <laughs> arts. What they've, what they've done is that they've taken, um, uh, I guess, traditional karate and then turned it into really an epic cyberpunk sci-fi type context and if you ever look at any of this the staging the the um, unreal engine graphics that's used behind a lot of the things um what they've tried to do i think is really are where we should be moving to next where if you can imagine two people in armor with lightsabers um with backstories that have maybe fed into like a, a grand saga in that kind of context i think that that really is going to be a massive winner um and i and i see you know um uh, how I say, you know, I, I see that the, the concept of sportification um, uh, has played up in, in all these different groups all around the world, and they've all tried to address it differently. But one of the things I would like to urge people to do is consider gamification, that um, it's where you are taking a sport and you're saying, well, what if now we actually, um, it's, it's not it's not live action role play, it is a sport still, but it has these other dimensions to it for storytelling, for um, people earning experience points in their efforts, for um, people tracking stats, for um, effectively turning what has been a sport into almost blurring that line of, of uh, gaming. Um, right, and so, right, right, yeah, right. I hope that it makes if sense. You well, you're in our international group. And for those that don't know, we have an international group that is just for lightsaber groups, leagues, and instructors. Um, within that group are people who, artisans who build lightsabers and things like that for the sport. But then there are um, sport combat and sport performance. So when you talk about gamification, that falls under sport performance. If you were to look at outer rim praxium, which is also in that international group, they're doing exactly what you do. They have created characters. There's a grand arc. They have a series of fights over a season. Um, it's very cool. Now, do they have your special effects and online stuff? No, they don't have that. You're, you've taken out a rim praxium and you're going uh, past that, a little past where they are. They're more like uh, WWE um, with lightsabers. Um, so they're, they're in, and there's a couple groups like that. I think if, um, if, if you're kind of covering all the bases of everything that's being done in the world of lightsaber combat, you're really an interesting group. And I'm sorry for cutting you off and dumbing it down for the 69 year old man. 
but I'm just totally fascinated by what you're doing. And I'm, I'm hoping I can steal some of your ideas and use it at my own Sabre Academy. Absolutely. Look, um, one of the things that I, I think I'll do once once the, the book is released in July, I'll, I'll send you a copy. Um, feel free to uh, get your crew together and, and see how you can also use that and it'd be great to work with you. Yeah, just one more fun thing. You know, we, we, we do choreography. We're doing a professional ball game here in May 4th. Uh, we've been on TV, but we haven't we haven't progressed into gamification and story building and things like that. I'm frankly, I hadn't thought about it until I saw the material that you were providing. And I think I think what you have to offer the Saber community is 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 unique. Um, and you still do regular martial arts. Aikido is my favorite Asian martial art. I wish you were closer. So I can come be your student for that. I'm too old to do some of the other things. And by the way, don't worry about Ludo Sport. Nobody else who does all the other Sabre combat, none of us could probably do Ludo Sport. Those guys are all uh, amazing athletes. They're all 5'11", five, five and they weigh 140 pounds. They're not built like Commander here, that's for sure. So, <laughs> um, But it would be it, – if you get a chance um, at some point, you know, post content to some of your fights that your students do because – we don't see much of what you would love to be able to see exactly what you're doing and see what you can offer. Don't be afraid to offer that out to the international group, at least, um, because I think you have a brilliant, brilliant idea. And and I'd certainly like to see more of it. Absolutely. I, I try to encourage a lot of people to to record the matches, but we do have a lot of uh, shy young people as well. So um, that that typically will prohibit us from recording things. Um, and that's I, I do anticipate Grand Saga. You'll see a lot more content in that aspect. Um, and I'm, we're hoping to really tie that in with a lot of the kind of fictional videos between cutscenes that we've done. So, um, yeah, watch this space and we'll see how we go. All right. One last question. And it's always one that's dear to my heart. Um, your student body what are your ages so for me we only go from 14 on up i have one i've had i've taught somebody who was 80 years old the oldest person i have besides me is 57 right now what what is your student makeup and and how do you how do you tailor your training to those young people that might have i don't know a high functioning autistic or or any of those or any illnesses somebody in a wheelchair mm -hmm. Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, we have um, we have a lot of students with with different needs and and, and are coming from um, different abilities. And at the end of the day, I, I do stress to people that what you're learning is uh, a martial art and it's weapons training. You can hurt somebody, and so that really means that you have to be very very serious and. Um, follow instructions and uh, make sure that everybody's safe. And if a person can't really um, do those things, then that in itself says maybe they're not ready for this right now. Um, and so, but it, saying that I've never had a person where I've had to turn away, most people are, are well aware that they have to follow um, those sorts of rules. But saying, uh, saying that as well, um, so we don't have saber combat, uh, like uh, the sport uh, based things, or I guess the light armored for children under the age of 12. We do have to um, have them have a certain um, size and body type, which is really the biggest thing that, that limits them after you know, following instructions. So if they can, if they're big enough to wear the armor and they feel comfortable and ready to do that, then we will let them do that. We won't say that, no, sorry, you can't do that until a certain age. Um, it is based more about their body size uh, and that the armor is going to be effective to protect them. Um, for those who are under that age, we do um, Sabre Academy Online or Sabre Academy, which is um, the more choreographed side of things. So they learn the they learn an actual martial art. They do learn Aikido. They do learn Jiu-Jitsu and they do learn Kenjutsu. Um, and then, it, but it's just simply um, doing it in a way in which um, they're focusing on something different rather than the skills. They're not they're not drilling hard in a skill with the aim of doing a big grading in in a in a you know, six months time. Um, they, they they're probably most likely. Um, just going to be working towards making short films and short choreographed exhibition things in cosplay. Um, we've also turned for the children's training, we've turned things on its head. We've made um, a lot grading more competency based. So for example, if a child is showing a lot of proficiency in break falling, as opposed to all the other bits and pieces, then we'll actually um, raise them to that skill level for just break falling. And then they'll gain experience points for having achieved that milestone. Um, and it, we find that that also means we can tailor 
training to young people and they're not getting that bit of stage fright or you know especially for those who do have um uh, are, are on the spectrum that they're not having to get in front of people and then present themselves and and in which case they may you know feel like they're failing or doing really badly so um i think that's something that maybe a lot of other groups might want to consider is having that skill map where you can then say, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna raise you to level one, two, three, or four proficiency because you've demonstrated that level of proficiency in that particular skill, uh, and then you can start to see students um, work out where they are on the skill tree and how that might progress and what they want to focus on, and and it's just another way of motivating them, I think. Well, I, I I'm seeing Arc down at the bottom, so I think our time is winding down. I do want yeah. I want to let turn this over to Arc here. Yeah, no, second, I, but I do. I, I just ahead. wanted to ask really quickly, um, and I apologize if it's something you talked about. And maybe I, I I wasn't here for, but have you had any? Um, um, uh, I do know that we have a few special needs uh, people in our in, that watch the show. People that are in wheelchairs or or need other adaptations. Have you come across that in your school? Um, and if you haven't, are those things that you can adapt for? Mm. Yeah, um, and this has been a really tough um, discussion. And, and in fact, you'll see this discussion play out over, across all sorts of martial arts dojos. Um, so I, I've had um, students who have attended um, with cerebral palsy. And so that means that, you know, they will have certain limitations on what they can do. And um, while we don't modify techniques um, in the sense of we, we surrender the efficacy of, or the um, the tradition or the history of a technique, um, A, that wouldn't be fair on even the person learning it. Um, we do say, look, here are a set of things that you we can do. Like we can look and focus on these particular areas, right? Um, and you can learn these particular skills. Um, and then in, and we might say, look, here's a context in which we might use this particular aspect to to suit um, you know your ability or where, where you're at. Um, you know, I, one of the concerns I've had with other instructors from other different, and you'll see this across the board anywhere, is that um, they're more about getting people in the door to get an, an income. Um, and in, it, there can come a point where you sacrifice what you're teaching in order to suit everybody. Um, and while you need to be inclusive and, and accessible to everybody, um, you also have a, if you have a tradition and a history and a background, something that connects you to many, many instructors before you, you also have, a, um, I guess, um, both an obligation to them and also an obligation to future students that what you're teaching is going to connect them to the past. And so I never want to compromise or, or um, sacrifice things, though certainly we do, we have an aspect where we say, look, this is from this tradition, and this is something where this is experimental. This is something that we can discover together and learn as we go and say, hey, look, who's ever learned a lightsaber and tried it in this context? And so there are other spaces that you can say, look, what if we do this together? You know, what if we try right. this together? So and that's um, what's the beauty of lightsabers is that lightsaber is accessible, something brand new. And we and martial arts instructors like yourself can adapt it to different situations that you couldn't deal with the original arts. Exactly. All right. All right. Well, Tony, go ahead. Uh, you got a minute or two. You, if you want to wrap it up with any last well, thoughts or anything, Tony, you've been doing uh, such a fantastic job. <laughs> I, well, I, I, can't, I, I can't just want to say enough. much, much respect, Mike. I mean, seriously, as one instructor to another, um, I'm impressed by your sense of history. For your for your own martial art, I'm impressed by your enthusiasm and determination. I'm really impressed by you bringing novel new ideas into the lightsaber community. So this is an important interview, and I'm sorry if I had to go a little bit slow and 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 break into the conversation. But if I can understand it, then anybody could understand it. And so I had to break it break in so I could understand it. Um, mm. I hope they do another interview with you again and your other instructors and feel free to bring any other instructors you have into the international group. I want to make a plug for the international group. Um, <laughs> Cause we need, we need uh, more sources of ideas and more different ways of doing things. So, uh, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, 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 Van, this is you. I appreciate the opportunity to do this interview. Yeah, no, I knew you would be perfect for this. If I if I couldn't do it myself, I, I knew the man to call. We do have one uh, question for the audience, um, from the audience, though, before we go. Um, and I'm not sure if this is something you addressed. Uh, this was somebody who was also at SAC Anime, so they got to the show late, too. Um, is it tough to do saber comment in mocap rather than filming it, um, or, or is it fairly or is it fairly relative? Sorry, I just got here. <laughs> 
Is this a question for myself or, or for yeah? Is is this something I guess that you maybe you addressed or was that um, no? No, actually, I have no idea. What is mocap? Just for well, soul, man. mocap is motion capture, but oh, motion I, I capture. guess you were talking about special effects or something. Was that maybe right. what that's relating to? Yeah, so, um, so I haven't I haven't used mocap myself. Um, the most that we do are green screens and and lighting. So I'm I'm not sadly I'm not as as techy as I'd like to be in this space. <laughs> uh, I need more people who have know far more than I do. Um, I've got a great guy um, who does who made a game called Rebel Pedal, and he's been fantastic in doing some Unreal Engine stuff and and other, giving other pointers. But yeah, the most we've worked so far is just green screens and then post production uh, with like um, Da Vinci uh, and Filmora. So. Okay, well, you know, it's it's very possible we'll have to have you back again as your your school expands, as more houses unfold, as as Netflix needs more dramas to air. We will contact you again. <laughs> Tony, go yeah, ahead. And close I, I want to see a faction fight. Yeah, I, I want yeah. I want to see a faction fight. That's what I want to see. I want to. Yeah. See yeah, and I'm sure <laughs> uh, with with all the bells and whistles. That's what I want to yeah. see. And, you know, so on behalf of us, uh, Tiber Cave and Saber Rattle and behalf of our audience, listen, we appreciate you taking the time out from, from Australia. Um, you know, you're you're in a really cool place and you've you turned out to be a really great guy and a really great guest. So, again, much thanks for you being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, the work that you're doing with, with uh, Aiken Saber Academy online, especially the international portal, and the work that Kyber Cave are doing is just, I think that these are the first steps towards something massive. So really appreciate the opportunity. Again, much love, brother. All right. That was that was outstanding. He was he was a great guest. He was knowledgeable and what they're doing. There's no kidding. Really great stuff out there. Man, um, appreciate- thank, you, thank you so much. You were asking all the questions that I wanted to hear about. This is this is a great like I said, I can't wait to go back and watch the, the first half that I missed. Well, listen, yeah, all you gotta do is give a call. It is it is Easter. My wife is mad at me and by uh <laughs> Oh no, I'm so sorry. By association, she's not happy with you either. So. Oh no, I'm so sorry. I'll have to send her a, a, a basket. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's hey, listen, it's all good. It was all worth it. They, they uh, as soon as I read his material, I knew that'd be a great interview to have. And as always, you know, you're you're you and and this podcast are so important to our our community, and I'll say ours because mm-hmm. you're an integral part of it. So. Bringing Thank you to the you. international group was a no-brainer, and and man, you and you guys are you guys are knocking out of the park with the variety and 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 the guests you have. I hope you. Uh, I've mentioned it before, and I'll, I'll send you something offline. I have a really good guest. He's a science fiction writer of some note. Um, oh, I think yeah. he'd be a great. I think he'd be a great a great interview. But listen, thank you for the opportunity. I don't know how we close this out. Uh, to all the guests. Thank you for uh, for joining us. Really, I uh, really appreciate you uh, paying, watching this old man fumble through my words and doing this interview. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Really quickly, I want to re- uh, remind you, if you have not liked this show, please like and share the show. Uh, leave a comment. That helps us get in the algorithm. We want to get this show out to as many people. We're on, goodness, we're almost up to 200 shows already. Can you believe that, Tony? 200 shows. I, I, I remember <laughs> when. Exactly. You've been through all of my other hosts and directors. (laughs) (laughs) And Um, still remain. Yeah, that's right. So you can always uh, give us some support by uh, checking out kybercave.com for all of your saber needs. You can also go to KCP Merch, where we have merchandise specifically for our webcast show. We have water bottles and blankets and all kinds of fun stuff. We have a Patreon page where for as much as little as a dollar a month, uh, we'll send you a sticker and you can help support this uh, this channel. We give away things like sabers and T-shirts and hoodies and all kinds of stuff at different levels. Um, 
But uh, any way you can help, even if it's just by liking the show and letting somebody else know that we can exist. And if you have any suggestions for people that you would like to see on the show, we take, uh, obviously, we take Saber School instructors, we take fighters, we take cosplayers, we take celebrities. We've talked to so many uh, incredible people on this channel. If you have any suggestions, please let us know on Facebook or you can email us at kybercave, uh, kybercave at gmail.com. So um, pretty much that's it. We're going to close out with our TikToks as we usually do. But I uh, once again want to thank Tony and, of course, Tony's wife, who I am currently on her uh, on the hit list for. <laughs> um, but uh, this has been fantastic I want to thank everybody that has tuned in today And everybody I got to meet at SAC Anime And don't worry about being late I was late too We were both late for the same reason It's that Sacramento yeah. traffic So to everybody else out there I want to thank you so much Ooh, wait a minute, hold on Because, and this is very rare of me I have been very organized I had to set like booked out for like two months in advance I can tell you who next week's guest is going to be Next week, uh oh, I got it back. Oh, no, wait, no, no, <laughs> I hit the wrong date. Okay, so next week, um, oh, I am excited about this next, uh, this guest that we have next week. Next week, we have a lightsaber company, they're a newer company called Proto Sabers LLC. But they, if you know anything about Star Wars lore, the first lightsabers had cables and battery packs connected to them, and right. this company specializes in making really cool. Proto Sabers. I didn't even know any lightsaber company wow. made Proto Sabers. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so a, we are going to meet one. Right, it's definitely a niche. A niche. <laughs> All right, Tony. Thank you so much. And uh, we will see you next week. And let me find these TikToks. All right. Take care, y'all. We love you. See you next week. Good night, week. everybody. Good Peace. night. Peace. Stormtroopers can't shoot the heroes, so I brought Walmart Luke Skywalker over here to prove you all wrong. Walmart? What the f***, bro? Grab my lace from Target. Why's that? Did that one go over your head, too? What? Dude, just, just shut up. All right, you ready for this? I'm about to send you to the court, pal. Yeah, whatever. Did you just use the force? Maybe. You can, dude, come on, you can't use that. That's not fair. Fine. All right. Use the force. Dude, are you gonna give me a fair shot at this or what? No lightsaber, you happy? Yeah. This is the one, guys. Anything for you, Luke? Where did he even come from? Same place as these X-Wings. One X-Wing? Yeah!